Life is full of happy accidents. One of my best happy accidents involves Star Ocean, a series of RPGs made by Enix and now Square Enix. Thanks to a misunderstanding with a friend, I was led to believe that Star Ocean The Second Story for the PlayStation 1 was the sequel to Lunar Silver Star Story Complete. So with no research or critical thinking on my part, I bought Star Ocean only to get it home and realize I hadn't bought what I had been expecting. Thankfully, what I did get was an amazing gaming experience that will stick with me forever. You may have heard the second story and thought, hey, what about the first story? Did you ever get around to playing it? Good question. The first Star Ocean game was released for the Super Nintendo in 1996, two years before the second story. Unfortunately, it never made its way to the West. I know the idea of a great Super Nintendo RPG not getting a US release seems crazy, but it's true. And Enix didn't even try to make it up to us. At least Square made an RPG especially tailored to Western tastes and intelligence. The West wouldn't see the first Star Ocean game until 2008 when Star Ocean First Departure was released for the PSP. The graphics were updated and the combat was changed to be more in line with Star Ocean The Second Story, which was also re-released for the PSP in 2009 under the name Second Evolution. Square recently decided to port Star Ocean First Departure over to the Switch and PlayStation 4 under the name Star Ocean First Departure R. Today I'm going to be looking specifically at the Switch port. The first half of this review will be about the port, while the second half will be dedicated to talking about the game itself. As someone who owned the PSP release, I can't say that I see much of a difference between that version and the one on the Switch. The graphic style and combat are pretty much identical to the PSP version. One of the features being touted was adjusted difficulty. I played through the first three hours or so of the game on my PSP, as well as loading up my save at the final boss, and I can't say I noticed much of a difference. It's admittedly a small sample size, but that's what I observed. One thing that has changed is the character portraits. They're... fine. There's nothing inherently wrong with them, and on their own I'd say they look pretty good. What I did find jarring is how little some of the characters' portraits resemble their in-game sprites. This is especially noticeable on a few characters, Millie and Parichi especially. They both have this odd shade of green in their portrait that seems way out of place when compared with their in-game sprite. It's not the biggest deal in the world, but as these portraits were one of the three new features being touted for this release, I think it's at least worth mentioning. On the plus side, if you really hate them, you can just change back to the PSP portraits. That said, the performance of the game is solid. I never ran into issues with the frame rate, and the game looks good with the Switch docked or in handheld mode. It's a perfectly competent port, and if you're looking for an excuse to get to play Star Ocean again, or if you missed out on the PSP version and want to know if the port is any good, I would say definitely yes. Now to take a look at the actual game. The game starts off on the planet Roke. We're introduced to our do-gooder protagonist Roddick and his two close friends, Dorn and Millie. They're tasked with guarding the village. It isn't too long before their village is beset by bandits because... reasons? It's a small village that doesn't appear to have anything of value. Maybe they're just upset because the shop is out of blackberries. It's here that we're introduced to Star Ocean's combat system. Unlike a traditional turn-based RPG, Star Ocean's combat happens in real time in an almost hack-and-slash fashion. If you've ever played a game from the Tales series, this will probably feel a bit familiar. Where Star Ocean differs from Tales is that there's no dedicated block button, and you're only able to map special moves to the L and R buttons. This doesn't necessarily make it bad, just different. Where I did run into issues was with my companion's AI. See, you only control one person during battle, and the other party members act according to the tactics you set for them. The tactic settings are pretty bare bones, and it can be difficult to get your team to do what you want. It's not uncommon for your melee fighters to immediately rush into the middle of a group of enemies and get the crap kicked out of them, as opposed to selecting targets strategically or at the very least waiting for someone to back them up. I often found myself rushing into enemies first to act as a diversion so that my AI friends didn't get the tar beat out of them. 
AI spellcasting is also a bit of a mixed bag. Instead of companions firing off a spell at their first chance in battle, they'll wait an unnecessary amount of time before casting each spell. This means instead of an area of attack spell hitting 8 enemies, the AI might wait until only 6 enemies remain and then cast a spell, making it less efficient. Healing is the same way. The AI will wait until a character is below half health and then cast their most powerful healing spell. This results in a lot of overhealing. All this is not to say that Star Ocean's combat is bad, I still had fun with it, but it is a bit rough around the edges. The last thing I want to mention about battles is the voice spam. This has never really bothered me in games, but I know plenty of people who get irritated when characters say the same things over and over in battle. Every special move and every spell is accompanied by a voiced line. They also talk at the beginning and end of battles and also when they level up. They often interrupt each other because one character can't finish their line before the next one chimes in. Again, I have a high tolerance for this sort of thing, but I wouldn't blame someone in the least for finding it a bit too much. One area that did cause me a bit of a headache was character recruitment. I found most of the recruitment process to be esoteric and unforgiving. It does work in some ways, and we'll talk about that in a minute. If you've ever played Chrono Cross, it works a lot like that, just on a much smaller scale. The game has 13 playable characters, four of them are automatically added to your party whether you want them or not. This leaves four party slots for the remaining nine characters. Many of these are mutually exclusive, meaning if you recruit one, you'll be unable to recruit others later, which can further lock you out of recruiting more characters. Sometimes this makes sense, like when one of the characters asks you to help find his sister. How would you know to find and recruit the sister if you never met the brother? Other times you'll find yourself presented with the option of adding someone to your roster with no way of knowing that doing so may lock you out of recruiting other characters further down the line. One thing I found particularly egregious was when, after finishing a dungeon with a temporary party member, I was presented with dialogue choices to recruit them. Despite selecting every option stating I wanted them to join, they took off. Even worse was that another party member left with them, leaving me with only two people in my party. Instead of just dealing with the consequences of my actions, I reloaded my most recent save, went back through a couple rooms of the dungeon with slimes that teleport you around the room, redid the boss fight and listened to some exposition again, mostly just to avoid leaving the dungeon with fewer party members than I started with. So that's the bad, but let's talk about the good, because there are some perks to the system. The main one being replayability. Despite the number of restrictions on which characters are able to be in the party together, there are a ton of different combinations that you can assemble. Not only do these different groups offer a variety of options in battle, they can also affect how you see the story. Having certain party members may mean that you get to avoid certain obstacles or open up areas you wouldn't have otherwise seen. For the most part, it won't impact the overall story in terms of the ending, but it will allow you to see the story through slightly different perspectives. For reference, I'm on my third playthrough and I still haven't seen all the different scenes you can get with different combinations and I've never used the same party twice. Speaking of things that can impact the ending, your character's relationships with each other can cause slight variations to the game's ending. Most of these are minor, but they provide some interesting insights into the characters that you've been traveling with all this time. These are based off a hidden relationship score between each character in your party. These values are mainly affected by the choices you make during the story and during private actions. Private actions are where your group enters a town and everyone goes off in their own direction. Roddick can then interact with everyone individually or as a small group. Sometimes this results in humorous skits, other times you get insights into the minds of your companions. On top of altering the ending slightly, raising your affection scores between characters has a practical purpose too. If a character feels strongly enough about another character and that second character dies, their pale will fly into a rage that doubles their attack power for 10 seconds. 10 whole seconds. Man, they process grief fast. I think the system is great as it shows that your party is bonding as they travel together. One of the other major features of Star Ocean games are skills. The skill system can be a bit tricky to explain without sounding too much like a tutorial, but let's take a look at it. As you travel from town to town, one of the shops that can usually be found in each settlement is the skill shop. These shops offer skills as packages, such as combat or technical. Combat skills, as you might expect, help out in combat. Some of these are better than others depending on the character. 
God Speed, which increases your movement speed and occasionally teleports you to your target, is great for melee fighters, but they won't get any value out of Recast, which shortens the timer between spell casts. The rest of your skills you learn are basically field skills. You'll be able to learn to do things like cook, compound, appraise unidentified items, and even paint or sculpt for some reason. You don't improve these skills directly though. As you level up, you'll earn skill points. You can assign these skill points to various skills like effort, which lowers the amount of experience you need to level up, or biology, which increases your max HP. If you raise a certain combination of skills, you'll learn a crafting or specialty skill. For example, if I raise Roddick's Knife, Recipe, and Keen Eye skills, he'll unlock Cooking. As you raise these skills, he'll become better at cooking and reduce the chance of failure. Specialty skills include things like Scouting, which allows you to raise or lower the encounter rate, Familiar, which allows you to summon a bird to do some shopping for you and bring you items, sometimes, and Oracle, which provides life-saving tips for the game. Well, at least getting thanked feels good. Super specialties are crafting skills that bring the whole party together to make something great. Or illegal. Either way is fine. Another great thing about skills is that some of them will increase your stats on top of allowing you to craft. Remember Roddick's knife skill from earlier? Well, every skill increase raises his strength by 10. Not only does this offer a degree of character customization, but it also gives you a reason to look at a character's skills even if you're like me and don't like to spend a lot of time crafting. This is a surprisingly deep system for a game this old. It offers a lot of decision making. Do I turn on the training specialty and take a hit to attack and defense in order to get more experience? Do I take an even bigger hit and use the enlightenment super specialty to earn more skill points with each level up? It's this kind of lack of hand holding that I love. I never felt completely lost or that I had no idea what to do next. The trial and error was in developing the right skills and using the skill system to my advantage. I think it's safe to say that I enjoyed my time playing Star Ocean First Departure R, despite a few hiccups along the way. The skill system alone felt like it was worth the price of admission. If you played First Departure on the PSP and are looking for more content, it's not here. However, if you just want an excuse to play an old favorite again, or if you're looking for a good point of entry for the series, then I can definitely recommend First Departure R. That's going to do it for me. If you enjoyed the video, consider giving it a like and subscribing as both those things really help me out. Also, let me know in the comments what you thought of the video and if you're planning on picking this game up or if you already have. And as always, thank you guys so much for watching. I'll see you next time.